So if I take a step back and look at any tech addressable market, right? So it's your smartphones, PCs, or even chips. China's roughly 20 or 25 percent of in demand. Uh, whereas with AI chips, today China's contribution is limited because of the uh, controls, export controls. Uh, but eventually we think China's consumption should reach the 20 or 25 percent, whether it is through the U.S. chips or domestically. Uh, so the situation is clearly fluid as far as H20 chips. I mean, it's kind of ping pong, right? I mean, one week approvals, no, next week probably there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah. So I think for us also to model what is the exact China contribution, it's getting very tough. Uh, so we are slightly on the conservative side from a China demand point of view. But I must admit, like what we discussed last time, China's AI self-sufficiency and also confirmed by DeepSeek's latest floating point standard, we think that that is something which will accelerate. We've seen the results from some of the Chinese chip companies this week as well. Uh, clearly, you know, last year China's chips contributed 33% of AA compute and we see that going to 50, 60 percent eventually because ultimately you cannot just, you know, get exposed to the geopolitics. How soon though? Because this will affect Chinese demand for foreign chips, NVIDIA chips. Uh, it will take time, right? I mean, we also, you know, talk about this in the past where, you know, you cannot just build fabs and also overnight. the advanced chips overnight, right? So it will take time. But I would see the weekend development or last week's development from DeepSeek, whereby DeepSeek is now taking a software first approach open sourcing some of these standards which probably can be embraced by a lot of these local Chinese companies. So I would say the key inflection point came last week and that standards, once it's available, right, uh, it happened with the telecom equipment, if you remember 15 years back, yeah. you know, the local companies in China, you know, took out the software part in the radio part of communication equipment and made it open source and you've seen how Chinese companies today are the dominant players. Uh, so eventually I think it will happen, but probably on the chip side it's slightly difficult, but I think in the next five years we would say China will come very close to its self-sufficiency. Mm, okay, uh, so a matter of time, next five years, but uh, buys, I guess, NVIDIA a little bit more time. Yeah. Sherry? Yeah, so five years. Uh, let's keep talking about the China's AI progress, shall we, Sandeep? So DeepSeek V3.1, V3 I think I should say, does it represent a, a signal of a China's AI progress, like China strengthening its domestic supply chain? Um, sure. I think the model for me is a bit more evolutionary than revolutionary, right? So it's what, mm. somewhat similar to the GPT-5 model, uh, taking the thinking and the non-thinking approach. Uh, so I would say it's rather an extension of these past two models. But for me, the leverage of this new floating point standard and kind of, you know, making it compatible. So I would say what DeepSeek has done in the last one week is uh, try to bring in an ecosystem compatibility, right? I won't think it's necessarily about uh, technology supremacy at this stage, but trying to make everyone in China compatible on one standard. Uh, similar to, again, TDS-CDMA, if you remember from the 3G and the 5G days, uh, that's what it did. And eventually it took five to ten years for China to be a leader in the TDS, CDMA technology, and then rest is history. So I think something similar would play out. When I say five years, probably that's a destination, but maybe in the next two to three years, we will see that accelerating. Mm, what did you mean by CapEx in, in, the, in digestion here uh, in your notes? So basically, investors need to think about the risk of a period of CapEx in digestion. And I think this sort of reminds me of what Dan Niles was talking about uh, earlier uh, this year, AI in, in digestion, and that's why the market is a bit confused here. But uh, talk to us about that and what is the uh, investment implication that could come out of this? Right. So what we are saying here is that, you know, before AI came, the big tech companies in the U.S. were roughly spending 10 percent, at best 15 percent of their revenues in CapEx. Now that's reaching 20 or in some cases even 25, 30 percent. So there is a lot of spending happening as we speak and probably that will continue over the next uh, six months. But I would say that given the revenues are not matching that pace uh, and the fact that depreciation is now a big, bigger part of their expense. So we would clearly see in the very near term, uh, starting from second half of 2025, margins for some of the big tech companies would come down. So we would say, particularly for 2026, some companies which might be th thinking, you know, hey, we overspent, 
probably they would say, you know, let's also slow down the pace. When I say slow down, we're not talking about decline, but instead of capex growing by 50%, maybe 20%, still pretty impressive, but that could happen. So we would wait and see how market will react if that happens, let's say in October results or even in the January results season. So Deep, I've got, a, I guess it's not a philosophical question, it's more sort of a technical question, right, about how you uh, view uh, uh, AI stocks, right? A lot of folks go like, ah, they're just, they're just not like software stocks, right? You get a bunch of guys, pay them a lot of money, right? And they kill themselves, they need to write code, you do it once, and then you print, copy, and your cost goes to zero. They're thinking the business model is going to be the same with AI stocks. Is it really? Because when I look at it, every time AI is used, right, a query, right, blah, 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 your data centers start uh, going up, right? That cost a lot of power, as uh, we know, right? So should AI stocks be looked at or viewed or treated the same as, let's say, software stocks? I think eventually that's the target. I think the issue why we are not there today is 60% of the spending today is in training, right? And 40% is inference. So that's the reason, you know, every, there's a race for every company to come up with the best model. So that's the reason training is still a big part of the spending. But once we reach inference, which could be, let's say, 60 or 70% of the spend, is probably when you reach that software kind of very good margin. So right now I do agree that one of the reasons why companies and talking back to the indigestion is that they're not able to deliver the kind of profit margins, it happened with cloud or other industries, with 70-80%, in AI it's much lower today. Okay, I hear what you're saying, right? But what about the cost of power, right? It's going to be just huge. These things are just, uh, they have an insatiable appetite for power. Right, so today 25% of AI capex is going to industrial AI, which is somewhat linked to power, right? And that will go to 30-35%. Uh, now, the good news is some of these companies are entering into strategic contracts. And I must highlight here China. Here China has a big advantage compared to the U.S. companies where cost power cost power. supply is much in a much better position. So when I take a long-term view, going back to the stage where inference will be a bigger part of AA spending, I think China will have a natural advantage given the power cost is much lower. So that's the reason I think power is definitely a bottleneck today. Uh, the big companies in the U.S. are able to solve it, but in China is definitely a tailwind.